consciousness, which obviously is a very, very difficult question. I think it's one of the maybe biggest questions science is actually trying to solve. Um, and I would like to, to start with uh, that simple question, well, I think we'll all agree we're, we're conscious, but when did it actually start? It? And the reason I'm very interested in the beginning of consciousness is that I have a newborn, uh, six week old, called Louis. And <laughs> so, so when I say very strange things, it's just because I'm sleep deprived. Uh, please forgive me. But I think it's a very intriguing question. I don't know if you remember, um, well, Normally, you don't remember being born, right? And, and your oldest memory would go back like age three, something like that. Uh, so the question to me really is, well, how consciousness somehow starts? How can we explain this? And I said it's, it's a tricky question that science, I think, kind of considered as, as a taboo, too difficult to, to even try and study. So historically, the the, the, the thinking about consciousness, about the mind, the spirit, the soul, was the field of religion and philosophy. It's only recently actually truly becoming a serious scientific topic. So, I was raised Christian, so let's look at what the Christian scholars say about when we as human beings become conscious. Well, as shown in this wonderful painting, Middle Ages, the moment of ensoulment, the moment that we become conscious, is bang, the day of conception. As you can see here, this wonderful couple just had a wonderful time, and then you see the little baby soul coming to the mother. There was another view, quite popular actually, since the ancient Greek philosophers, such as Aristotle, but still very popular um, into the Middle Ages, that considered that somehow um, the menstrual blood after conception organized itself into a human being, as you can see again in these wonderful drawings, and that would then happen exactly 45 days after conception. So again, bang, you become conscious, day 45, at least for boys. So Louis would be 45 days. For some obscure reasons, Aristotle said, this is going to take more time for women, actually twice as long, so that would be 90 days. <laughs> well, as a scientist, I propose we now leave religion and philosophy behind us to actually confront our thinking with actual observations. And this is the beginning of the Enlightenment, the end of the Dark Ages, Renaissance, and people like Leonardo da Vinci, who actually was the first to make observations of a fetus, giving us these wonderful drawings, but still very limited to say meaningful things about the mind or possible consciousness in the fetus, in the uterus. And now, of course, we have the technology to... <laughs> proud dad. Look how the baby develops. And we have many and many of these ultrasound images. We can even make fancy 3D reconstructions. But still, it's very frustrating not to know what's actually happening inside brain, when and how would this fetus having any thoughts, having any perceptions. Now, at the university hospital and uh, the GIGA consciousness uh, research unit, we're all very excited to try and understand consciousness, but we mainly see adults. But thanks to a European project called Luminous, we could collaborate with colleagues in um, Germany at the University of Tübingen, and they have very, very powerful technology. So this is a machine that captures very small changes in magnetic fields. And actually there's only two such machines on the world, one 
in Tübingen and the other one in Texas, but this is the best one. And so, well, with our colleagues um, together trying to understand by all possible means how consciousness can be explained, my highly pregnant wife, you see there, happily laying in this machine, where there is a, a kind of hole where you put your big belly in, and then, without any danger, passively this machine will capture the magnetic changes. This is called magnetoencephalography, whatever the uh, name. It permits you to look inside the living fetus and check if there is a change in his brain, electrical activity. Because when you say change in electrical activity, that changing current actually creates a little magnetic field. Actually, it's terribly little. Some compare it to try and listen to a mouse walking during a Metallica rock concert. So it can be done, but it's really tricky. Anyway, there we are in Tübingen. Machine permits them to see how this fetus reacts when, for example, you flash light through the belly. And we now know that the baby's brain will react. For Louis, who was here a guinea pig, he was politely asked to listen to sounds. And, well, it was clear his little tiny brain responds to sounds. Actually, it could make a difference, it could detect and had a different activity when it was a new sound. And that's what you see on this graph. So, you have moment zero, a sound, a new sound is presented, and then you see this kind of wave here that shows that the brain is reacting differently to different sounds uh, at the moment they are the red arrow points. And now these researchers are trying to understand, and my little Louis could very well be the first fetus ever, to show working memory. So they have these very, very smart experiments where they try to understand, well, how long this little fetus can keep this information and um, it seems to be the case, but it's still early days and many other mothers need to be studied in uh, the university there, that yes, you can and very much do learn already in the womb. Um, and I think that's just wonderful. It's wonderful because it has, of course, many consequences, both ethically and clinically. This is the first picture of Louis. He screamed like hell, and when he calmed down, as for all newborns, they do this little blood sample, and again he screamed, and I remember the nurse saying, oh, don't you scream, I know it doesn't hurt. And I was thinking, well, do you? What do we actually know about pain in newborns? When I was at university in, in the 80s, in the textbooks it still read, Newborns are unconscious, just a bunch of reflexes, and they can't feel any pain. And so, consequently, surgery was done without giving any painkillers. That was a historical error. Now we know, many scientific studies have shown, that newborns do feel pain, and now receive painkillers as it should be. But so it's a very difficult question, isn't it? Because we can't ask the baby what, if anything, he thinks, he perceives. And so to me, this is, of course, fascinating to know this picture was taken yesterday. What is going on behind these wonderful eyes? What is going on in the brain, in the mind of these very, very young babies? And of course, as we just um, discussed, we know that there is a lot of activity, a lot of learning actually already going on during the fetal development, but then things after birth really accelerate. So 
Little Louis, six week old now, we know he's making thousands of connections. So we all have these billions of brain cells. Actually, you're born with quite a similar number. But what really changed is how these cells interact. That is the strength of your brain. Okay? If you look at your brain, there's brain cells we call neurons. And what makes them terribly different from any other of your cells in your body is that they are connected to other brain cells. Many, many thousands of connections in many billions of brain cells gives you this astronomical number. And this is constantly changing, right? So we were discussing with our friends, the, the physicists, that the, the universe isn't static. Well, your brain isn't static either. It's, it's rather a continuous stream of consciousness. It's like a, 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 an ocean full of waves permanently changing, and really it is extremely plastic and making new connections, communications at this very early age. So right now, little Louis, well, hopefully he's asleep, but tomorrow, and even during sleep actually, he's making thousands of connections each and every second. And that's just the beginning, when he will uh, in a couple of months, reach age one, he will make nearly one million every second. Nobody knows exactly how many, but the numbers are really impressive. And this is the miracle of human development, of the developing mind, of emerging consciousness. So we are born with a brain that's already wired for some functions, but then many, many things will happen when we interact with the environment. And actually, again, we now have scientific studies that can help us to reduce the uncertainty about what truly is going on behind these beautiful, I'm not very objective there, eyes in Louis. And this is an app you can actually freely download, developed in Boston, that gives you a glimpse of what newborns actually see. Maybe you can guess. What's up there? Whoa, that's an informed guess. Yes, indeed. So, of course, this is not a mature brain. This is very imperfect vision. But you already see, and you correctly guessed, this, this was a face. And then things progressively. So today is six weeks. He would see something like this. Poor thing. And then things progressively. Um, become what we call normal vision. And this again is little Louis, some days ago, uh, imitating his father, and also having this very strange device on his forehead that now permits us again to go a bit further and to look with these three electrodes what's going on in his brain, in his mind, and, well, he's once more a guinea pig now in this other project called the Human Brain Project, where, again, with many, many colleagues throughout Europe, we're basically trying to understand human consciousness. And this, to me, is extremely fascinating, and I think we should also be very humble there, because as a neurologist, I have my preferred organ here, and this is a real brain, so this is uh, a woman um, with her plastinated brain, and I hold here in my hand everything that made her human. All the emotions, all the perceptions, memories, we think are in these thousands of billions connections we call synapses. And so, better understanding how this progressively emerges, develops, and also how consciousness can be impaired during pathology, when we become sick, when we <coughs> suffer from neuropsychiatric diseases. From early childhood or at very old age, I think this is truly an exciting field where the knowledge can be translated to clinical care and improve um, the way we diagnose and treat 
these different neuropsychiatric diseases. But let's go back to little Louis and how his brain activity actually looks like when we monitor it for many, many hours gives you something like this. This is a collaboration with um, colleagues in Israel and then the trick is, of course, to give sense to these tons of data. So this is very, very easy, three electrodes, but then you can capture different components of this electrical activity. I think it's very clear in the beginning, the dominant color, so you see time from one, two, three, four, five minutes, and here are different, what we think, components of cognition of consciousness. So the top line, for example, you see, again, it's, it's very blue, then something happens, actually, he's um, waking up, starting to cry, and these are considered to be um, reflecting his stress levels. And the others here are more attention-related. And then we have emotion. We have all these different components of what we call consciousness that we're basically trying to decode from a recording of electrical brain activity. So I wanted to share this with you, of course, because I'm very personally involved now in this emergence of consciousness with little Louis, but with the team at the University of Hospital, most of what we do relates to adults with very severe brain damage. But basically the question is the same. What can we meaningfully, what can we say in any meaningful way about thoughts, perceptions in people who also can't communicate? So this is the big frustration. Everyone here having a baby knows you can't ask them why they're crying, what's happening. The same frustration I feel when I'm in intensive care or in rehab settings with people who have very, very severe brain damage after a, a traumatic injury or after a bleeding or after a cardiac arrest where they're resuscitated but are comatose. And then the trick is to try and measure, I would say, the impossible, the unquantifiable we call consciousness. And so this is what we, with the team at uh, the hospital in Liège, are faced with every day, every week, uh, patients coming from uh, all over Europe with this very difficult question, is there anybody in there? Is there a functioning mind? Is there some residual consciousness or not? And unfortunately, this is something, well, it's not very sexy compared to what I started talking about baby consciousness, but this is also very real, okay? So we're now um, discussing about really human drama, but this, unfortunately, is happening each and every day in Belgium, anywhere in Europe, and you should know that the first cause of death in young adults is traumatic brain injury. It's also the first cause of very severe handicap in young adults. And I think this field of coma survivors has kind of been neglected by society, by uh, the medical community. And so let me maybe very briefly explain what one can observe after this very severe brain damage we call coma. So this picture here shows a patient who's a young adult, had a traumatic brain injury and he was resuscitated on the spot of his car accident. Without modern technology, he would have died on the spot. Okay, so what we now call intensive care is actually something that um, started in the 60s after a new machine was invented called the artificial respirator. So this was um, in Copenhagen, um, a medical doctor who invented this machine that permitted doctors, now called intensive care physicians, to make patients with very severe brain damage breathe. And then uh, a whole um, explosion of questions um, arose. 
because it was not only the beginning of intensive care, it was also the beginning of this whole ethical reflection about what we now call therapeutic abstinency, because modern medicine can do many, many things. Right? In intensive care, as you know, there's a lot of machines, and these machines can actually replace the functioning of basically all of your organs, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, but not of your brain. Okay? And so, with this new machine came a whole discussion about what should we do in patients we can now make artificially breathe, but what we know there is basically no brain left. So should we continue? So it's not because we can use these new technologies and, and uh, modern medicine that we should also, in each and every case, at all costs continue. Part of our job as a medical doctor is also to say, well, we lost the battle, we let die. So in intensive care, some are comatose, meaning basically they can't be awakened. So a coma patient will never open the eyes, okay? And all the movements we will see will be reflex. Actually, there will be very, very little movements. And then things can go wrong very quickly and evolve to what we call brain death. Or the patient is in an irreversible coma where all the tests show he will not show um, a functional recovery, and the team decides to stop. This is a very difficult question, because of course, we're always right. When we say he's gonna die, we stop the machine, five minutes later he's dead. So we need to be very careful, because we don't want to live in a society where we stop the machine too quickly, when there is still hope, and maybe we're not giving, especially these young patients with a traumatic brain injury, their chance. But also, we should have the courage to ask the question, not to just continue at all costs. The majority of intensive care death is because we let them die, because that decision is being made not to continue. And then there's these, especially young people, where we, we don't really know. And so we continue, and then they one day open the eyes, as this young man, and yet show no sign of consciousness. This was called vegetative state in the 70s. I think it's a terrible term. We shouldn't compare human beings with plants. So now we call them in an unresponsive wakefulness because that's what we see. Their eyes wide open, as here, but cognitively not responding. So they're not answering to simple commands because this is my consciousness test. Actually, when I say consciousness is very difficult, nobody truly understands. Well, how do I do as a medical doctor when I say he's unconscious? We'll basically reduce the complexity of consciousness to two main dimensions. So, let's take a volunteer, um, the lady in red in the front. No, you can sit, you can sit, you can sit. So the question is, are you conscious? What is your name? Esther. Esther, okay. Is Esther conscious, right? So, first thing we'll check is whether you have the eyes wide open. I saw you dazzling a little bit this white picture. So, now she's fully alert. And this is the first thing we will check, okay? Because, of course, when I'm getting boring and I see people, then you, at one point, will no longer be conscious of what I'm saying, right? So, the first component is really wakefulness. That's very easy to check, eyes wide open. If not, I would go down even pinch Esther's finger to make sure, and a coma patient, as said, will never open the eyes, okay? But then you have these very strange people we call vegetative, unresponsive wakefulness, so they are eyes open. How do we measure consciousness? And maybe I should cite, I will not cite many philosophers, uh, but our most known Belgian philosopher, Jean-Claude Jean Van Damme, yes. <laughs> when he's talking about being aware. Huh? So is Esther aware of herself, of her environment? How do I know that? Well, of course, I can ask her. And this is how we do it every day. We share our thoughts. We communicate verbally or writing things down, sending emails. But people in coma, like babies, can't communicate in any functional, verbal, nonverbal way. 
So then basically, we have a very, very simple test, and it's actually the same test since my colleagues in ancient Egypt. So it's Esther, move your hands. Yeah, they couldn't see that down there. That's it. Okay, now we're all happy. Maybe there's no philosophers in the room. If not, we always have long discussions. But this for us, being very pragmatic, we're in the hospital, we want to know if Esther is conscious. We ask something, you know, she did it, fine. The problem is, if I ask her and she's not doing it, did I actually prove that she's unconscious? There's many, many biases, right? And so we shouldn't forget this medical doctors, caregivers, that when we try to measure consciousness, all we're actually doing is making inferences, making some conclusions, based on some motor response, right? And that often can, can be problematic, because maybe after a car accident, a trauma, there is a disconnection between Esther's brain and her muscles. Maybe her brain is saying, move, 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 but the Nerves are cut, the spinal cord is damaged, and then, of course, you can very well be aware, and yet, not move, fail the test. There's other problems with the test. Come on. Maybe she doesn't want to move. Language, yes. Of course, she needs to understand the question. Right? There is something we call aphasia, which means you don't understand language. And then we, we're in trouble. Maybe she's deaf, then we'll write it down. There's many other problems. Actually, I remind, uh, it makes me think of one uh, patient who uh, I saw afterwards in my consultation. And he said, Dr. Lores, I remember you asked me to look up to the ceiling, squeeze your hand, but I just didn't see any reason why. So, I'm in trouble, right? I don't know Esther, but... So, this is why we want to go further. And of course, now again, we have the technology to make these wonderful images of the brain. So, this is the young man called Loris, who had this uh, car accident. He was sent to us from France and let us together look at his brain scan. So, you have my brain, that's supposed to be normal on the left, and his brain, and we can really surf through it. You see, you just saw the eyes. The gray is the gray matter, and then the black here is liquid, actually taking the place of what normally should be brain volume. These are ventricles way too big, so there is much too much fluid, because basically the brain is gone. So this is very often what we will see, in people, when they crash 100 kilometers an hour against some uh, truck or, or hit uh, a concrete wall, you have these connections. And we said, this is so important for your brain. This is what makes your brain so special. And they will just snap. And then the brain cells will die. And this gives you the image we just saw of basically a shrinked, shrinking brain. Um, and we can make these very nice images, but of course we want to know more. These are just photographs, okay? But we want to know how this damaged brain still functions. And then we need other machines. And of course we can, combining all this information, not just look at the brain cells, but also the connections themselves. So let us look inside his brain, and you see, again, as compared to my brain, supposedly normal, where you see these branches, it's like a tree, right? All these colors represent brain tracts, like the big highways in our brain. And the blue are those going down to the spinal cord, to the muscles, the red is the one connecting the left and the right, because you have two, two big hemispheres, and then the green ones are going from front to back. And I think it's clear to see, we'll go through it once again, that in his brain, when we look inside, 
there is many, many of these tracts, of these branches that are broken, that are gone. So again, it, give, uh, it gives us a way to measure the damage, not just to the brain cells, but also, and very importantly, to the brain tracts. And still the question remains, despite the severe damage, how does it function? And therefore, we have another machine. Historically, it was the PET scan, that stands for positron emission tomography, whatever, but it gives you a way to look inside a living brain. Because your brain, I hope, still is terribly active, right? It's actually the organ that uses most of the energy of any other of your functioning organs right now, if, that is, you're not sleeping. And we can see that because we can inject radioactive sugar in your vein, it goes into the blood and of course it's eaten by your brain and then we see these colors in a normal brain, very yellow, very active, taking up this sugar, this glucose, and then we can see, again, the very damaged brain, it's much smaller, but still we see yellow. So despite the fact that Loris was considered to be vegetative, awake, but unresponsive, fully unconscious, the brain scans told us, yes, there is very severe brain damage indeed, but still somehow there is a flickering mind. There is still actually quite a lot of his brain that is using energy, that is functioning. In other words, he is still a little bit conscious. If he would be completely unconscious, everything would be dark blue there. Okay? And it is not. So here we see inside the brain measuring glucose uptake, but as you can see on the image also the electrical activity in the brain, um, that there seems to be something going on. And then it's very frustrating because we've shown he is somehow, sometimes, a little bit conscious. We call this now minimally conscious state. This is really very difficult for us because by definition these patients can't communicate and we know that sometimes they are feeling, perceiving. And then the challenge is not just to make the diagnosis but to actually give them a voice, to try and interact with them. And now again we have tools, so you've seen all these electrodes that permit us to measure the electrical activity and then we can ask questions. We can again present sounds, just as we did with little Louis, and now measure the activity, ask the patient to do special things that we can capture, and then try to make uh, this brain-computer interface as a simple yes-no communication tool. And so we have, very exceptionally, but they exist patients where it's just impossible to get any communication at the bedside because we depend on some motor interaction. And these technologies permit us to bridge into their mind, give them a voice, ask them questions. So you see again time and the electrical activity. So this bump here and all the area that is green is a reaction of his brain that he can then learn to control and then can learn to say yes and no to simple questions, but very important questions, questions about what he wants, what he feels. So I think this is truly uh, important clinically, ethically, and documents that yes, sometimes we know, thanks to technology, that despite all the evidence that we can gather by the clinical, classical examinations that sometimes, yes, we know that the patient is in there and that, of course, makes a tremendous difference because you don't want to be in a bed to be labeled vegetative and be treated as such, whereas in reality you do feel things, including pain. Same problem as we discussed with little Louis, same huge ethical consequences. But then again, of course, here in the case of brain damage, this is very different from a developing mind. This is a damaged mind where we try by all possible means to stimulate it. 
Now, this is a big, big challenge. And I think that the whole field um, of coma survivor rehabilitation is uh, currently, well, there's room for improvement, to, to um, say it uh, politely. And very often, patients and families after intensive care are kind of lost and very difficult uh, period to find a rehab center, to find a nursing home, and then to find reinsertion home. So I think we should improve uh, and pay more attention to this, what I think is a silent epidemic uh, in coma survivors. So talking about the therapy, there's many, many things that we do with the team, trying to develop new drugs, trying to actually stimulate the brain through surgery, but um, given the, the risks of those invasive procedures, we've invested very intensively in what we call transcranial direct current stimulation. It's trying to put electricity through two electrodes, and the aim is to activate the areas in yellow there. This is part of the awareness network. And so far, the studies show that, yes, there are patients, despite the severe brain damage, patients such as Loris actually participated in this study where we put a current 20 minutes every day and his condition improved. Now, this is very, very difficult because we want to make sure that um, it's actually the intervention that made the difference. Maybe he just recovered, uh, would have just recovered anyway. And also we need to be very careful not to give any false hopes to all these families. And this is a big challenge. But maybe as problematic can be the f uh, feeling as caregivers that nothing can be done. And then there's not just false hope, but there's also false despair. And I think in the field of severe brain damage, maybe there has been this um, incorrect um, feeling of false despair and that nothing could be done and hence we don't do anything and then of course patients don't get better. So this study here try to really find out, well if we give some placebo, so you know any clinical trial, so when we try a new drug, you will give the drug but you also give a placebo, right, a sugar pill. And then you will, um, in, in large, large cohorts of um, patients, you will just randomly, that means you just coin, you just toss a coin hat, uh, you will give the placebo first and see what happens with consciousness scales that give a number to consciousness and then you compare it with the real stimulation. So the graph here tries to show that when you give um, the real stimulation, and this is the, the start, and then day one, day two, day three, day four, so every day they get 20 minutes, and you see this line going up. And this means that their consciousness is going up, okay? If you just give a fake stimulation, so the thing is just giving some electrical currents um, that give some tingling, but nothing really happens uh, inside, well, they also will not get better. So now we've reason to believe that for some patients, it's about half of post-traumatic um, patients or in between this kind of uh, gray zone we call minimally conscious, do get better and only when we get this electrical stimulation. I think this is very important, and uh, some of my colleagues say, well, why should we care, right? Uh, you don't cure them, okay? Of course, they don't go back to work, go back to school, they don't become their old self, because we can't, you know, transplant the brain. We can actually transplant the heart, the kidney, lungs, but for the brain, it's much more complicated and also ethically much more different, because classically, when we talk about organ donation, it's better to be the one who receives than who gives, right? But for the brain, donation and transplantation did clearly is different, so your brain is very different from all of your other organs, okay? But presently, we can't transplant brains. What we can do is improve our care. As said, to give them proper rehab, to use the new tools to reduce the uncertainty about um, possibility of consciousness and possibility 
of recovery. And that's what we're trying to do with the whole team. And I think it's wonderful to see that now more and more teams in Europe are trying to indeed care for coma survivors. So that's one part of what we do. Another part is trying to better understand these patients by looking at pharmacological coma. So general anesthesia is for us a very interesting model because let's come back to um, our wonderful volunteer. We can give her anesthetics and see what happens in her brain when she loses consciousness. This is done by the second lab. We also use um, hypnosis. Hypnosis has this terrible um, charlatanesque uh, connotation and we, we all know these shows and, and you know um, mesmer and, and wonderful uh, performances and yet I think it's also a very interesting clinical tool so uh, we have an anesthesiologist called Marilis Femoville who actually very courageous of her said well I think that maybe I can use hypnosis in my daily practice so she's an anesthesiologist and now has over 10,000 people. 10,000 people who had a surgery and normally anywhere on the planet you would be in deep anesthesia. And she proposed something different. She said, well, uh, I will try to um, accompany you because she hates to say I will hypnotize you. She, it's yourself, you, you, you yourself as a patient put yourself in this so-called hypnotic state. It's not magic. It's basically being dissociated from your environment. It's being less aware of your environment and more aware of yourself. And you're basically daydreaming, thinking about your holidays. We had Queen Fabiola, it's not a secret, it's in the public domain. So she had a, a the thyroid, this big gland that needed to be removed, and at a certain age, General anesthesia is not without risk. So she was there thinking about Spain and the surgeon was cutting. And I think this is very, very impressive. And we're now using this also scientifically to see what's happening in the brain. And what's happening in the brain is that you have a consciousness awareness network. Okay? Actually, two. So in your brain right now, I hope, it will soon end and you can switch them off, but there is this external awareness network. That is everything that goes through your senses, right? What you see, at least when you're still eyes open, what you hear, this sensory awareness depends on this chunk and this chunk. So it's, it's a big network, and each hemisphere very probably has its own awareness. And for those who are right-handed, it's the left dominant one that has language that can actually express it, okay? So this is the external awareness network. If I would take Esther's brain, if we would have ethical approval, and I would take my scalpel, and I would remove that, she would still be there, happily looking around, but she would be completely unaware of everything around her, okay? But she would still have the second component of awareness, which is that, that's the little voice talking in your head right now, okay? Internal awareness. That permits you to think, oh, he's taking a lot of time, you know, I want to get my cocktail. Um, that little voice, it's so wonderful, actually, you're able to have that. Nobody truly understands why, but we know, at least this is our team's um, hypothesis, and the data go with it, that this is an internal, so this is in the midline, the front, and the back. So if then I would again take my scalpel, Esther, permit me, take this away, then she will be completely unaware, okay? This is actually what we see in deep anesthesia. This is what we see in deep sleep. Now, sleep is fascinating because we also dream. And in dreaming, you're unaware of your environment and of yourself, but then in dream sleep, you have these wonderful experiences, right? You can fly and have all these crazy um, dream uh, state consciousness, and then this internal awareness network gets up again. So we're trying to translate knowledge about neuroscience, brain activity, awareness networks to um, clinical care for coma survivors. And maybe 
one last slide about something very, very uh, fascinating, and that is near-death experience. So I don't know, um, I always ask when there's these crazy events, if anyone had a near-death experience, please share it with us. The email address is there. We need many more um, testimonies. So it's a very difficult subject to study. You all know these stories of people with like a cardiac arrest, about 10% of them, and when they survive, they will tell you, whoa, I have felt great. It's very often positive. And I saw this light, and I actually saw my own body from outside. Very, very interesting phenomena. Wonderful movies, a lot of best-selling books, very, very little research. Okay? So we're trying to change that. We now have over 1,500 of these near-death experience stories. So please, if you know anyone who had one, become number 1,501. I think it's about time for me to end. I don't know where Jay is, but just some moments to explain what's happening in these uh, very, very fascinating realities we call uh, near-death experiences. Well, we've seen already a normal brain activity, so this should be you, it's all red, it's all yellow. Brain death is very different. Brain death is death. So far, no one with the criteria of brain death ever came back to tell us what it was like. So, I don't know who here is an organ donor, is enrolled as an organ donor. That could be way better. So in Belgium, you know, so tonight is too late, but tomorrow, Go to the um, uh, Maison Communale uh, town hall and register. Just inform uh, that you are or not an organ donor. Because for some near-death uh, experiences is proof of life after death. I think we need to be very careful there. However, we have scientific evidence of life after death. It is called organ donation. So in this situation, there is no activity whatsoever in your brain. Only the skin, you see, is still using some sugar. Then you can, without hesitation, give your organs away. This is the patients who are comatose. Sometimes, when they survive, they have these near-death experiences. Uh, but they were not dead. So you can only die once. James Bond was wrong. Okay, so, well, I showed you all of these sexy images, and I just want to conclude, we also need to be very careful. We shouldn't be arrogant as a scientist. So far, nobody truly can explain how matter becomes consciousness, okay? It's, I think, um, uh, a wonderful uh, and very, very important uh, in, in, in our human life, we didn't talk about animal consciousness, but if you've got any questions, uh, we can discuss it. Also, for those who are interested and are still hungry, there is a book in Dutch and in French uh, that tells you more about what we know and do not know about consciousness. In the end, we try, coming back to the coma patients, to give them a meaningful life. And just as consciousness, just as pain, quality of life is terribly, terribly difficult to measure. So we asked patients with a locked-in syndrome, I didn't describe it yet, but these are people who survived their coma. They're fully aware, but fully paralyzed. They can just blink with one eye, and so we can ask them questions. It's a terrible situation. You're like in a disconnected brain, fully conscious, but fully paralyzed, and we ask them the question, how are you? Okay, well, the answer was, on a scale from minus 5 to plus 5, the vast majority said, yes, we can have a life worth living. In other words, we shouldn't judge a book on its cover. I think we should be very, very careful. I try to tell you some of the historical errors when talking about consciousness. I think we considered it as all or nothing, as black or white. And consciousness is much more than that. We all know it's 50 shades of grey. Actually, no, it's not just one dimension, it's many, many dimensions. So I think consciousness and the wonder of its emergence in newborns and of its recovery in some of the coma survivors is rather all the colors of the rainbow. Thank you for your attention.